You ready? First, sister, I didn't want to correct you. The Canadians were playing last night. They're playing golf in Florida. I was surprised during the break to meet some of the sisters who were unbelievers. They don't expect that in a crowd like this. There are some unbelievers out there. You know who you are. You pass by me, check in, make sure that my hair was not dyed. <laughs> you know, it's not my fault. My, my great-grandfather passed away, was 84, did not have white hair at all. Actually, didn't have much on the top, but all, all around was dark, dark black. So it's not my fault. How are we doing with the traduction back there? Ça va bien la translation? Uh, the, the traduction. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So we continue. The subject that I've been asked to speak on this, uh, this morning is a broad one. Certainly a very interesting topic that could easily require more than the time that I'm allowed to talk this morning. That being said, I'm pleased to share some thoughts and some of my convictions in this field of initial and ongoing formation of consecrated men, women, and priests. Please note that I am not an authority on this subject. That is important for you to know as you listen to what I have planned to share with you. My experience in this field is in two parts. First of all, as all of you, I went through the process of initial formation as a consecrated member of my institute from 1976 to almost 1982. And I'm still going through ongoing formation as a priest, as a bishop, as a cardinal. I do not see the day where this will end. I still have so much to learn. On the other hand, I was involved as director of initial formation in my institute for a number of years and have been a professor and formator in a major seminary while I was in Colombia for five years. And of course, now as the Archbishop of Quebec, I am continually interested in both of these topics, initial formation, ongoing formation, not just for our clergy, but for the lay associates that work with us, les agents de pastoral, and we have many that we share the mission with, and of course, in all the uh, congregations, orders, monasteries, new communities in our diocese. We have close to 2,000 consecrated men and women in the Diocese of Quebec, and I'm very proud of that. I understand that formation is a process that involves the task of integration, which is a constant that leads to organizing reorganizing and restructuring oneself modified by various events, happenings, and relationships. It involves a development toward attaining a sense of responsibility in the use of freedom. Now, I didn't invent that, by the way. A, uh, the prioress of a monastery in the Philippines gave a talk to her nuns uh, that I once read, and that, that phrase struck me. And I've been using that for quite a while. In all of this, whether it be initial formation or ongoing formation, the key word to me seems this one, growth. Growth is the key. Growing in the life of the spirit, in faith, in hope, in charity, through seeking God in community, to follow Christ and to strive in constant conversion of the heart. That has been going on in our life since the day we were baptized. Initial formation, 
should lead the candidate to consecrated life to embrace Jesus Christ in a profound relationship. There he goes again. He's going to talk to us about that again. He did it in the first part. He's coming back and hammering at it again. Well, that's all I talk about everywhere. Because it's the core of our life. profound relationship with the Lord to learn to discern God's will and respond to it. Every spiritual family, order, or congregation has its particular traditions and ways to accompany its new members in the stages of initial formation. But it seems to me that there are some common denominators and sound bases that are necessary in all situations. At least that is the perspective I'd like to share with you this morning. I believe that it is of utmost importance to lead and accompany the candidate to consecrated life into a personal relationship with the Lord. That is the foundation to living as a Christian. And of course, even more as someone prepares to enter consecrated life. Pope Francis, you've noticed, insists very much on this. In his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, in the third paragraph, just almost as an opening statement, he writes, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask all of you to do this unfailingly each day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. And the Pope continues, the Lord does not disappoint those who take this risk. Whenever we take a step towards Jesus, we come to realize that he is already there waiting for us with open arms. Now is the time to say to Jesus, Lord, I have let myself be deceived. In a thousand ways I have shunned your love, yet here I am once more to renew my covenant with you. I need you. Save me once again, Lord. Take me once more into your redeeming embrace. How good it feels to come back to him whenever we are lost. Let me say this once more. God never tires of forgiving us. We are the ones who tire of seeking his mercy. Christ, who told us to forgive one another <laughs> 70 times 7, has given us his example. He has forgiven us 70 times 7. Time and time again, he bears us on his shoulders. No one can strip us of the dignity bestowed upon us by this boundless and unfailing love, with a tenderness which never disappoints, but is always capable of restoring our joy, he makes it possible for us to lift up our heads and to start anew. Let us not flee from the resurrection of Jesus. Let us never give up. Come what will. May nothing inspire more than his life which impels us onward. I read this paragraph many times a week since Pope Francis has published Evangelii Gaudium. It helps me so much to stay on track. It is so affirming, inviting to let myself be renewed, restored in this relationship that is at the core of our being. It seems to me that we cannot move on to fruitful initial formation if we do not all we can to help young people that come to us encounter Christ. Pope Benedict XVI wrote as an opening statement in his first encyclical Deus caritas est, and I quote, we have come to believe in God's love 
In these words, the Christian can express the fundamental decision of his life. Being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life and a new horizon and a decisive decision. Isn't that beautiful? An encounter. Encountering Jesus Christ is encountering God's love. It is recognizing that we are loved and that Jesus brings new life to us and brings us to new life. We sometimes welcome into our communities, our seminaries, new converts who have already met the Lord and who have begun to grow. Many of them, at the beginning of their conversion process, or in the first stages, feel called to consecrated life or to the priesthood, and are enthused by their encounter with Jesus Christ. They sometimes even seem to be overly enthused. That shouldn't worry us. These candidates need time to integrate their new relationship with the Lord in their lives. I say that because I've seen some of these candidates sometimes be so hurt by the groups that have welcomed them because they thought they were fanatics, they thought they were lunatics, they're just too expressive, they'll never hold up in our group. Give them time. For some Encountering Jesus and his mercy has really made such a big change in their life that they want to express that joy. And they need somebody who will accompany them and a community who will understand that and give them time. Not to lose the fire, but to lose these fanatic outbursts. A second conviction I feel very strongly about is to invite the candidates as they begin their initial formation to open up to Holy Scripture, to the Word of God, so that they can, right from day one, discover that the Bible is not a book. It is a constant dialogue between God and humanity, between God and us between God and me. It is an encounter with the Lord and candidates to consecrated life need to begin a daily relationship with Holy Scripture. Every candidate, as every Christian should, should have as, a, as his life companion his own Bible. And for you and for us, I add, his own bravery. Two instruments to deepen spiritual life and deepen their covenant with the Lord. Did you know that still this year, the Bible continues to be the best-selling book in the world? They don't put it on the charts anymore because it's, it just blows the top. So many translations. The best-sold book in the world, and yes, the less read. So many people have Bibles in their homes. You've got the big family Bible that usually is in a box so nobody will get it dirty, <laughs> that you never open. You've got the Bibles and the New Testaments you've received at different stages of your life. You've got a great collection. We just fail to open up the scriptures and let it, that encounter happen with the Lord. I remember the first times I visited the formation center of our institute. I was not even a candidate yet. I was just coming to explore and get to know a little better this institute, this spiritual family. But members invited me to join them in reciting divine office. I was lost in the bravery that they had lent me for the occasion, of course, going back from one page to another and one chapter to another. I didn't pray much. But I discovered rapidly how important 
it is to learn to live with this book of prayer, the book that puts the word of God in your mouth and in your heart and on your lips at every hour of day or night that you want to pray in communion with the body of Christ. Isn't that awesome? We pray daily with the word of God. That sows something good in our hearts. It's an invitation that I've taken seriously, trying to develop a permanent dialogue with God. Same thing with sharing the Word of God. Early on in my institute, we were taught to share God's Word in small groups. They helped me to discover the life and words of Jesus and learn to love Him even more. Discovering how He really is the Son of God, the Savior, the way, the truth, and the life. Sharing the Gospel taught me so much as I discovered how Jesus related to people and events. Learning also to listen to others share and learning to share the Word of God prepares us for missionary work. At first, when I began sharing the Word of God in small groups, it was a little intimidating. I was a young adult with very little formation in this field. In the group were older lay members, consecrated members, who'd been there and had known the founder had a lot of experience. There were some priests sometimes, married couples, associate members. But I rapidly discovered that we were all there for the same reason, to welcome into our lives the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and to share Him, and to grow with Him, and to walk with Him. A gospel sharing group is not a biblical course or a discussion group. There are other places, for the, other places for that, and that's fine. We need those. Sharing puts everyone at ease and on the same level. We are all God's children, open to hear and welcome His Word. This small group experience was a weekly event that would take up an evening every week, combined with song, a little prayer, fraternity, I was finally doing what I saw my parents do when I was 10 years old. That changed their life, and it has changed mine. I would easily say that learning to share and pray with the Word of God has played a major role in my initial formation and has had a great impact on my life. When I became a bishop, in 2009, nine years ago, I did not have the time to go back every week to my little group. Once in a while I did, but finally my bishop appointments and activities took over and I lost a little bit of that. But when I became Archbishop, I became the boss. <laughs> Cut that out of the tape, will you? I decided to implement this activity of sharing God's Word in every meeting in our diocese. I invited our pastoral teams, our parish councils, our financial committees, our lay associates, everything that moves and works with us serving the mission in the diocese. I invited them. I didn't oblige them. And everywhere we went, whether it be on pastoral visitations, meeting with different groups, we invited people to share the Word of God. Instead of just starting with their Father, Son, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord will be with you. Which is fine. We can take an Our Father, Hail Mary. It's beautiful to pray. But I suggested that we take 20 minutes at the beginning of each meeting to share one page of the gospel. Unless, of course, we have a very big agenda. Then we take 30 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> it tells people what? What do they get out of this? 
The word is important. That is, the Lord brings his people together when we break open the word, when it's in our midst. It's changed quite a bit in our meetings because now we come to our meetings with the Bible. <laughs> Even when we have bishops' meetings. <laughs> and I'm the one who has to, to animate the group. They know now, oh, Jerry's doing this, better bring your Bible. <laughs> it's changed our diocese in many ways. We now have hundreds, literally, hundreds of groups of people all over the diocese who meet to share the Word of God every week. We have people in huge buildings of condominiums who have asked their neighbors to start doing this. They get together. We have people in small rural areas that go to the local restaurant and have breakfast together once a week, very early, and share the Word of God. And it's helped us, priests, deacons, bishops, and people who work permanently in the diocese and offices, not just to prepare things for other people, not just to prepare talks or give good advice, but we feed together on the Word of God and it transforms us. So you know that I strongly suggest that in initial formation, you find a way to help your young people discover this treasure. In 2008, there was a synod on, of bishops on this topic, the place of the Word of God in our life in the mission of the church. The apostolic exhortation that came out of that, of Benedict XVI, was, and it still is, a spectacular document, full of insight. Let's go back to that. At the beginning, when we started doing this, we had a few complaints. People thought we were becoming Protestants. <laughs> but now I think we appreciate more and more what it's doing in our lives. This beer is flat. <laughs> I say this because if the Word of God is not at the heart of our life, nourishing our relationship with the Lord and teaching us by the Master to become His disciples and apostles, we're going to put something else there. You know, sometimes I worry when I see members of institutes of consecrated life quote more often the writings of their founder and their founders than the gospel. I mean, it's fine to have a lot of respect and to quote your founder, your founders, the, the, the people who were there at the beginning, it's just normal. But if it pushes the word of God aside, mm, I have questions and doubts. Another important aspect that I see as fundamental in initial formation is the quality of the persons who are chosen to accompany the candidates. As young people today come to us with a great variety of experiences, the formators need to be dedicated to walking with each candidate to help him or her in her personal or his personal situation in history to grow to a fuller maturity in human and spiritual life, to grow in the discovery of the charism of the community, and to learn to love the community and its apostolic life, its charism, its vocation. All of this happens often simultaneously. While the candidate, in a period of growth in initial formation, is dealing with personal issues, struggling, and learning to enter into this new way of life. Becoming a consecrated man or woman in a community, whether it be a, 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 a cloistered community or whether it be a community that's out there doing other work in the church, is quite an endeavor. It's life-changing. In Africa, they say 
that it takes a whole village to ed educate a child. I think we can say that it takes a whole community to form a consecrated man or woman. Of course, we need people who are dedicated to initial and ongoing formation. But this has to be taken up by the whole community. We all are responsible for the people that come to us to help them. I have found it very helpful, helpful to sometimes prolong the time before a candidate begins his initial formation or seminary life so as to get to better know him or her and better discern if he shows signs of a true vocation. Pope Francis has some wonderful reflections on the importance of discernment. In his latest apostolic exhortation, Gaudete Exultate, not only to the formators that need to be well prepared in spiritual discernment to accompany candidates in the initial formation process, but they also need to help candidates to learn how to discern God's call in their everyday life. Here are a few thoughts from Pope Francis on the subject, and I quote, it's number 170 in the exhortation. Certainly, spiritual discernment does not exclude existential, psychological, sociological, or moral insights drawn from the human sciences. At the same time, it transcends them. Nor are the church's sound norms sufficient. We should always remember that discernment is a grace. Even though it includes reason and prudence, it goes beyond them. For it seeks a glimpse of what unique and mysterious plan that God has for each of us, which takes shape amid so many varied situations and limitations. It involves more than my temporal well-being, my satisfaction at having accomplished something useful, or even my desire for peace of mind. It has to do with the meaning of my life before the Father, who knows and loves me, with the real purpose of my life, which nobody knows better than me. Ultimately, discernment leads to the wellspring of undying life, to know the Father, the only true God, and the one whom he has sent, Jesus Christ. It requires no special abilities, nor is it only for more intelligent or better educated. The Father readily reveals himself to the lowly. Discernment, helping people discern and initial formation, and of course this will go on in ongoing formation also, helping people, helping people to learn how to discern God's will in their life. That is helping them become mature. Another necessary aspect of initial formation is to introduce the candidate to consecrated life into community life. That can be a very challenging and difficult experience, depending on the candidate, but depending also on the community. And I would say that this goes for all types of consecrated life, even for the order of virgins, members of secular institutes, who oftentimes live alone, as it goes for monks in a monastery or cloistered religious. There can be no true Christian life without a community. It is not possible to live the gospel without belonging, being rooted in the body of Christ in some way or other. Belonging to a community is a balanced and healthy way to live one's life as a Christian. It puts us in contact with other believers, followers of Christ, reunited in the same congregation, order, or institute of consecrated life. It brings people together who share the same charism and the same mission. Whether their particular vocation 
calls them to live under the same roof or not. The fact is that without a community, without being linked, it is virtually impossible to survive in consecrated life. We need each other on a human level and also in a spirit, as a spiritual family that shares the same spirituality. Learning to appreciate and love your spiritual family, the community of men or women with whom you share your life is an essential part of initial formation. Learning to relate to others in your community that like you are not perfect is necessary to learn to deal with the reality of life. They tell the story of a, a young man who had been to a monastery. He wanted to enter and effectively he was there for a few years. Oh, at the beginning, he looked at all the monks who were there and said, they're all saints. So beautiful. These loving and beautiful, welcoming people. As time went on, he discovered that they were probably all devils. Maybe not. He began to see other sides of their characters, of their personalities, of their history and decided to leave that community to search for a better one. And he did finally find a second community that seemed much better. And he started and belonged and went to begin his formation. And it was going very well until he discovered the same difficulties and left abandoned. So he went to see his spiritual director who had known him for many years and said, listen, I've tried on my own to search for a community that really lives what it professes to live. A community where people are really becoming holy and don't have all these ugly issues. Help me find one. So the spiritual director said, yes, I will, I will look. And uh, he says, I found one. But the day you enter that community, it will cease to be holy. <laughs> part of initial formation, it seems to me, that was part of my journey also, is after the falling in love part, you come to see that your community is not perfect and that you're not perfect. We're all walking together and learning to live the gospel. We're in a process of conversion. That's so important that we realize that when we're initial formation. Learning to appreciate and love your spiritual family the community of men and women with whom you share your life is fundamental. In our families, we have members at all stages of life, babies, children, adolescents, adults, older men and women, and finally, some members of our family who are preparing for the final encounter with the Lord. In consecrated life, or in the presbyterium of our diocese, it is the same. We relate to people at all stages of life and that is healthy and good. It keeps us grounded in reality. It helps us to be truly human and Christian. In other moments of our history, when we were very numerous in our congregations, sometimes members were organized by age groups. But nowadays, with smaller communities, small sometimes, we share with many generations. And the newcomers are sitting next to the wheelchairs. That can be quite a challenge, but it can also be very good. That's what life is about. And the gospel, 
of Jesus Christ is strong enough to sustain us and help us to learn to love each other. We must not forget that we will, we are, we are and we will always remain human beings. We are not angels. How beautiful to learn to live fully our humanity in the midst of the world, in our community. A humanity renewed and restored by the new life we experience and the mercy in Jesus Christ. People should be able to look at us, our communities, whether they be men or women, brothers or priests, look at us and say, how do these people live together? How do they support each other? Look at all these characters. <laughs> well, that's what love does to you. That's what a relationship with the Lord that is continually inviting you to grow, to love, to go further and beyond what you can do on your own, that's what it does. That's the witnessing, the charity, the love that the world needs to see. A fifth reflection I want to share with you is as candidates for consecrated life enter initial formation, I believe they should already be brought to understand that although they are just beginning entering into a new vocation, they already have a vocation common to all Christians, and that vocation is still in force, holiness. Pope Francis, in his most recent apostolic exhortation, affirms that holiness is the most attractive face of the church. I quote him. With this exhortation, I would like to insist primarily on the call to holiness that the Lord addresses to each of us. The call that he also addresses personally to you. Be holy, for I am holy. If you've already read this document, have you noticed how the Pope doesn't talk in general terms? He talks to you and me, you, and he asks us questions. You know, some documents you can read and it's very, very interesting. This is not only interesting, it's, it confronts you. It brings you to respond. The Second Vatican Council, writes Pope Francis, stated this clearly. Strengthened by so many and such great means of salvation, all the faithful, whatever their condition or state, are called by the Lord, each in his own or own way, to that perfect holiness by which the Father himself is perfect. Of course, we all know that holiness is a lifelong process, but candidates to consecrated life must be led to understand that it is their ultimate goal. Life's only mistake is not to become a saint. Did you know that? <laughs> the Holy Father's words of encouragement and reflection are an eloquent invitation. He says, let the grace of your baptism bear fruit in a path of holiness. Let everything be open to God. Turn to Him in every situation. Do not be dismayed. For the power of the Holy Spirit enables you to do this. And holiness in the end is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you feel the temptation to dwell on your own weakness, raise your eyes to Christ crucified and say, Lord, I am a poor sinner, but you can work the miracle of making me a little bit better. In the church, holy yet made up of sinners, you will find everything you need to grow towards holiness. The Lord has bestowed on the church the gifts of scripture, the sacraments, holy places, living communities, 
the witness of the saints in a multifaceted beauty that proceeds from God's love, like a bride bedecked with jewels, end of quote. The Pope is so affirming, showing us that it is possible to become saints. People in initial formation need to hear this because as they strive for this great new adventure, they rapidly discover their weaknesses, shortcomings, difficulties. And the Pope says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep walking. The church will offer you everything you need. Don't worry. He walks with you. Of course, initial formation also includes many other aspects, depending on the particularities of each, each institute of consecrated life. I insisted, insisted on these five points because they seem to me to be common denominators for today's life in the church that can contribute to forming the missionary disciples the church needs today for its mission today and tomorrow. Now a few words on ongoing formation. Once arrives the date of the first vows or commitments or the final vows, just as when arrives the date of ordination, after a long period of formation, there is a natural movement in us that says, I made it, I'm done, now I can live and be on my own. Is that true? Put away the books. Put away what everything we've done. We're ready to tackle the world. I hear sometimes parents say this when their children celebrate the sacrament of confirmation. We're done with the sacraments. I've got all my papers in order. My kid's ready. As for them, or consecrated men and women, finishing the stage of final, of initial formation can seem like a graduation day. Well, there is some truth to that because initial formation does prepare you for life and for your mission. It helps you look at all the aspects of your life and put it into perspective in relationship with your vocation. But as soon as you graduate, begins a new chapter, as important as the first, ongoing formation. It should come as to no surprise because in every profession or trade, people are constantly involved in ongoing formation. Secretaries who have not been on ongoing formation Never learned that you can use a computer now. You don't have to erase everything you type on your manual computer. Ongoing formation is above all to help the person to believe more in oneself, in the community, and in church, and to believe more in Christ. This demands a conversion to a new learning attitude in consecrated life a new, a renewed learning attitude. I think the first persons that need to be convinced of the need for ongoing formation is the individual himself. It is his responsibility, her responsibility, to acknowledge the need to continue to grow. In other words, it is a responsibility of a lifelong formation process to strive to always respond better to the Lord's call. That is true for personal growth on all levels, human, spiritual, professional, relational, community life. This is true for everyone, but I believe that it is especially true for consecrated men and women in the church. Their call to follow Jesus more closely must keep them on their toes always looking how to deepen not only their relationship with the Lord, but seeking to be a better witness in their everyday life and in their missionary work, whether, whatever it may be. 
initial formation is broad. It puts you in movement. Ongoing formation will help you deepen your relationship. Help you deepen the sense in your life, the direction to better respond to what God is calling you to do. They tell the story in a Quebec maple tree forest a few years ago. You know, in spring at this time of year, I mean, b trees are barren, there are no leaves, nothing. But if you go back in the month of July and August, leaves are wide open and trees are filled with beautiful green. Well, it just so happens that one beautiful morning, a leaf from up top of one of the highest branches of one of the maple trees in the forest was dangling there in the wind and looking around the mountains, the sceneries, the fields. <sighs> it was so beautiful. The view you have from up there, just amazing. He was looking around. And all of a sudden, as he was looking, he looked down to the ground and saw this thing coming out close to the trunk of the tree. What are you? He says, I'm one of the roots of the tree. A root? What do you do in life? Oh, I have a pretty important role, you know. I'm the one who sends up the sap and the water and the minerals so that way up in the trunk and the branches and way up to you there, green leaf, so you can have life. Oh. And the leaf looking down on that poor, ugly root. But it must be so sad to be a root. Here I am with the beautiful view, the wind in my leaf. I get to see sunrises and sunset. Poor you down there gets to see nothing. And the root said, what do you say we have this conversation next autumn? <laughs> Ongoing formation helps us to deepen our roots. So we'll resist the autumns and the winters of life. It helps us stay on track so we'll become better holier, consecrated men and women. Of course, there are excellent tools and resources for ongoing formation. It may be necessary at some stages in life to experience a time of sabbatical, or at other moments in life to participate in workshops or courses, or participate in some kind of therapy of accompaniment, whether it be spiritual or psychological. I'm less aware of what goes on in a lot of your communities, but I see with the priests in my diocese, I've seen a need in these past years to invite priests and offer them these resources. It'd be good for you to take a year off and go for some formation and accompaniment to help you deal with this issue, to help you find again, put you back on your feet. You're doing your best, but you're struggling with so many difficulties, interior difficulties, that you need extra help. That's what the church is there to help you. Go, oh, this place, these people can help you. That's normal. And we need to be aware to help our brothers and sisters grow. The superiors of institutes of consecrated life have the responsibility to see that every member of their community is challenged and furnished with the necessary means to continue to grow. But all members need to understand that they need themselves to be very involved and interested in the growing process at all stages of their life. If this happens, we can talk 
about a culture of ongoing formation. I am also a firm believer that community life, ordinary life of prayer, study, fraternity, fellowship is the natural place for ongoing formation. Living consecrated life in its ordinary form should help individuals grow. We help each other. Some because they have special talents and are very helpful. Others because they challenge us, because they're very critical or sometimes a little bit nasty. Challenge, challenges us to become better and not respond with the same. Finally, what I believe that every consecrated man or woman should consider is that ongoing formation is their renewed yes to God's call at every stage of their life. It is great medicine to prevent from mediocrity and staleness. Consecrated men and women who do not continue to grow in their vocation all through their life can easily, can easily lose their joy and the passion in their life. Ongoing formation is the Lord's call to constantly come back to Him with all our heart. That first reading from the prophet Joel every Ash Wednesday. is quite an invitation to all Christians. But it resounds in a very special way. In my heart and in my life every Ash Wednesday. When the Lord pleads me and pleads us. Come back to me with all your heart. There's some coming back to do every year. To get back on track. To be renewed, restored by Him. Brothers and sisters, may the Lord sustain all of you who are involved in ongoing formation, accompanying, accompanying lovingly, respectfully, your brothers and sisters to holiness to a spirit-filled life in Christ. May we continue this journey until Christ is formed in us. Thank you very much for your attention.